This is our regular Saturday evening front of Language of the Heart meeting. My name is Jim. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, this meeting is a meeting of the Stairway, <coughs> Stairway Group. We have three meetings here every Saturday. 1.30 in the afternoon is our sponsorship workshop. 7.30 is our big book meeting. And 9.15 our Language of the Heart meeting. For those of you who may be new with us, The Language of the Heart is a book which is a compilation of all of the writings of Bill Wilson for the grapevine from 1944 through 1969. And there's material in Language of the Heart you can't find anywhere else. It appears nowhere else in the literature. Some of the most important stuff ever written about alcoholism and about, excuse me, about the program and the fellowship. So, in this meeting, we take a selection from Language of the Heart, and then we discuss it. <clears throat> and it's a free-flowing discussion. There are no rules. We just uh, we speak when the Spirit moves us, and speak as long as you want. We try to get uh, stick pretty much to the subject, and we share with each other what what we believe or what we've experienced about these various matters. Tonight we're going to be looking at the question of spiritual awakening. And uh, we'll find an article on that in a couple of minutes. But first, let's join together in a moment of silent meditation. We'll say the serenity prayer together. Thank you, serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. <clears throat> courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. <clears throat> and Alcoholics Anonymous to the fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other, and may solve their common problem and help others recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for a membership. We are self-supporting to our own contributions. And they is not allowed to any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. And I wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse it nor oppose it in any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober, help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety, and it is customary and traditional in this group to read a portion of chapter 5 from the big book. Who'd like to do that tonight? Come on, my boy. I don't know. Rarely have we seen a person fail to a silly far back. Those who do not recover, people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. It's usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. But our such unfortunate is to not fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our story is disclosed in a general way what we used to be like what happened in the world right now. We have decided to know what we have or are willing to get in the way and we have to take certain steps. In some of these we bought, we thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. So an earnest and search man, we baby to be fearless and thorough at the very start. Some of us try to hold on to those ideas and resolve as nil until the best food. Remember that we did alcohol, cutting back from the powerful. Without help there's too much for us, but there is one who has all power, and one God. May you find him now. Half the nation is dealt with nothing, we stood the turning point. We asked for protection and care with complete abandonment. Here are the steps we took which, which are suggested as a program recovery. When we remember Palace over alcohol that lies at a common manual. Two, came to believe that a power of great ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made searching and fearless moral living for ourselves. Five, admit to God for ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our own. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, may this of all persons be harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, may direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when it is so within the dinner others. 
and continue to take personal inventory and move along promptly then. Eleven, sought to pray meditation to improve our contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for the knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry it out. Step twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to pray as met to our colleagues and practice these principles in all our affairs. Many of us exclaim, what an order, I can't get through this. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We're not saints. The point is that we're going to grow along spiritual lines. The principle that set down guides the progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter 3 Gnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. And C, that God could have been willing to solve Good, thank you, Tom. We're going to uh, go to page 233. In language of the heart. This is the first story in uh, part three, or uh, the first article. All of these articles in segment one are articles by Bill addressing various uh, aspects of recovery. And uh, He entitles this article, The Greatest Gift of All. Now this article is, concerns itself (coughs) with the, uh, with the spiritual awakening. Now, the spiritual awakening is a very strange animal in our big book. Because it is only, it only appears one place. And that's in the step itself in chapter 5. Nowhere else is that phrase ever used. It might be in some of the new stories, but I haven't seen it. But in the first 164 pages of the big book, spiritual awakening is not used, except in one place. When Bill originally wrote the big book, in the original manuscript, the phrase spiritual awakening didn't appear at all. The phrase that he used was spiritual experience. And this, this ties in with everything else in the book, especially in chapter 2, there is a solution where the solution which is offered by AA to the sufferer is to have a spiritual experience. Bill met by that not an epiphany, not a bright light or burning bush, but a combination and combination of experiences with God over a period of time that the spiritual experience was cumulative rather than instantaneous and there are some instances of instantaneous epiphany type experiences they're scattered throughout AA I've met maybe two or three people who claim to have had that remember in Bill's story he tells us that's what happened to him when he got on his knees and said, God, if you're there, show yourself to me. And he had a massive experience right on the spot, which never left him, by the way. It stayed with him the rest of his life. When the big book was presented to the editorial committee, after Bill had completed his original draft, they decided, among other things, to change the words spiritual experience to spiritual awakening. As a result of that, the term spiritual awakening is nowhere defined in the big book. Now, we can, we can pretty well tell those things which are included in a spiritual awakening by reference to the rest of the book. For example, it's quite clear that a spiritual awakening includes Entering the world of the spirit. Being restored to sanity. Becoming God conscious. Conscious of the God within. 
sensing the flow of God's Spirit into us and developing what Bill calls a vital sixth sense, which means that we develop a, an intimate relationship with our higher power wherein we can be inspired and intuitively guided, a lot of which will occur as we meditate. It also must include the coming of gratitude. Gratitude is a very important concept for us. We need to know that when we feel ungrateful, we are not spiritually fit. That when we feel gratitude, we are spiritually fit. If we feel ungrateful, we'd better look to see what's going wrong. If we're going to find a problem spiritually. It also includes a high degree of humility, the spiritual awakening does. The recognition that God has all power and all knowledge is all we need to know. We can spend an hour in a meeting with 14 or 15 people sharing about humility, and all we really need to know is that God has all knowledge and all power. If we have none, then we have absolutely nothing to be egotistical or prideful about. So it's really just a matter of accepting as a fact that all knowledge and power belongs to God, and whatever we receive, we receive as a gift. So there are a number of things which clearly belong within the concept of a spiritual awakening, even though they are never defined as such. And I hope the, 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 the reason for that lack of definition is clear, that this was a last-minute change. And the reason it was changed is because there were people at that time in the fellowship who were strongly agnostic or perhaps atheistic, who insisted that this business of spiritual experience had to go, that it was too misleading. The same people who foisted off on a so-called Appendix 2 in the back of the book. Their, their primary concern was that a, a new person reading the big book would come to the conclusion they had to have a bright light burning bush epiphany in order to recover. Well, that was, that's pure sophistry because the big book tells us four different times that's not so. That, uh, God comes to most men slowly. It happened to come to Bell with suddenness. Nevertheless, they were successful by way of compromise to get the term spiritual experience changed to spiritual awakening. However, it turns out that regardless of what their motives might have been, it was a very, it was a very important change because we can identify with an awakening of the spirit perhaps a lot easier that we can identify with having had a spiritual experience. So what the 12 step says is that having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps and that's that and Bill now calls it in, in this article the greatest gift of all. Now I agree with that. Spiritual awakening is the culmination the goal. That's what we're working for as we work the steps to arrive at this. The greatest gift that God gives us is to awaken spiritually. Let's see what Bill has to say about this, page 233. The greatest gift that can come to anybody is a spiritual awakening. Without doubt, this would be the certain verdict of every well-recovered alcoholic in AA's entire fellowship. So then what is this spiritual awakening? This transforming experience? How can we receive it and what does it do? To begin with, the spiritual awakening is our means of finding sobriety. And to us of AA, sobriety means life itself. We know that a spiritual experience is the key to survival from alcoholism and that for most of us it is the only key. 
Please note that when Bell wrote this article, he slipped back to his spiritual experience, even though the article is supposed to be about spiritual awakening. That's because Bill didn't differentiate between the two. They mean exactly the same thing in the big book as he wrote it and in his own mind. And that this spiritual awakening or spiritual experience is the key to survival. And for most of us, it is the only key. This is the theme that we stress so much in our meetings in the stairway group. That we don't have any other program of recovery. We just don't. And yet it's so very, very simple. Work the steps and you will receive a spiritual awakening. And it is from that that recovery will come. He goes on to say, we must awake, or in other words, awaken spiritually, or we die. So now, that makes it, there's no, there are no weasel words there, there's no equivocation, is there? We either awaken spiritually or we die. And of course, that's because, as we know from our, from our basic AA, that we are alcoholics and alcoholism is a disease which will kill us. And that we can't stop drinking on our own and that we need God's help. And this is the only avenue we have to recovery. So we must awake or we die. So we do awake and we are sober. Then what? Is sobriety all that we are to expect of a spiritual awakening? Again, the voice of AA speaks up, No, sobriety is only a bare beginning. It is only the first gift of the first awakening. If more gifts are to be received, our awakening has to go on. By the way, that means it will continue for our lifetime. And it does go on. And if it does go on, we find that bit by bit we can discard the old life. The one that did not work. That's what we were talking about in the earlier meeting. We get, we stop doing the stuff that didn't work. We identify what that is as we do our inventory. We stop doing those things that didn't work. The one that did not work for a new life that can and does work under any conditions whatever, regardless of worldly success or failure, regardless of pain or joy, regardless of sickness or health, or even of death itself, a new life of endless possibilities can be lived if we are willing to continue our awakening. And this is something I talk to people about all the time. People ask me for help. I tell them over and over again, you're starting now. There is no limit to what you can do with your life from here on. Everything that's happened before is history, ancient history. The only thing we can possibly do with it is learn from it. If we can just get the idea that we get to move on from now, I can tell you a hundred anecdotes about how that's worked for other people. Amazing, beautiful, wonderful stories all of them true. But somehow or another we have to get it through our heads that we're not stuck in the bloody past. The past has no power over our present or our future unless we let it. If we change our actions, the past does not repeat itself. If we don't change our actions, it most certainly shall. So how important it is for us to learn what didn't work and start doing what will work. It's also critically important for us to have vision, to have a belief, a vision for our future that we are working toward. Not just stuck in the sadness or the trauma of today and the repining and worrying and fretting over the past or spending our days in fruitless worry about the future. If we have this vision and we're working toward it every day, it sets into motion all of the dynamics we need which will pull our lives back around 
and will focus our lives and give us some discipline and consistency. It's hard to believe. It's hard to see it, especially if you're mired in the past or in the in, in what you consider to be a, an ungodly future uh, uh, present. But it is all there, and then it depends upon us. And we have to keep in mind the, the old old saying: "If it's to be, it's up to me." I've got to do the work. And if I'm willing to do that, miraculous things will happen. Soon after he entered AA, a certain newcomer approached me and he said, I'm sober and it's mighty near a miracle. I admitted that I was licked, came to a few meetings, began to get honest with myself and my sponsor. Then that awful urge for a drink suddenly left me. There had been no more booze fighting. The desire for alcohol simply evaporated, and I can't understand just why or just how. Here in AA, the folks are wonderful. They care and they understand. It's a brand new world to me, but, continued Mr. Newcomer, I'm still plumb puzzled. I don't see just how this God business fits into practical living. And when they talk about a new life for an old one, I can't take it all in. Sure enough, I'm sober, and that's new. But now what that I've gone ex-grog, what's the matter with trying to live my old life? That was okay, until liquor got me. I was going places on my way to making my pile. Things weren't too bad at home either, till my wife yelled she had enough of me and left. All I need is sobriety, and they can keep on giving me that. Now I can go on about my business. I am sure I can make a better job of it this time. The rest of the story goes on to show just how seriously wrong Mr. Newcomer was. This particular guy was fortunate. After four years, he still hadn't relapsed. And he finally figured out that walking around with untreated alcoholism is a terrible way to try to live your life. He finally realized as he says over here on page 235 second paragraph as I slowly learned acceptance my pain subsided I began to wake up and look around I began to see that my modest job was a means of living and of serving society the bigger and the better job can no longer be my chief aim Then I looked at AA. What had I done for the fellowship that had saved my life? Mighty little, I had to confess. So I began to go to meetings with a very different attitude. I quit my envy of the financially well-heeled AAs and listened closely to what they said. I learned that their money was no longer a symbol of prestige. It was a trust for the best use to which it could be put. They also showed me that the temptations of riches could sometimes be worse than the pains of poverty. I also found that there was no such thing as an unfortunate AA, that is, if he were a real member. If sick, he was by fine example and inspiration to those both sick and well. If poor in pocket, he could often be rich in spirit, an eager worker and servant of our society. I now see that awakening and growing is something that never needs stop and that growing pains are never to be feared, provided I'm willing to learn the truth about myself from them. And that's the profound truth that we need to learn. Every time you hear chapter 5 being read, listen to what the first paragraph tells you. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program, usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. When you think honesty, think self-honesty. Because without self-honesty, we don't make it. This is not a program for sissies. It takes courage to work the steps and to face ourselves. And we're going to be doing that facing of ourselves the rest of our lives. It's just the way it goes. It goes with the territory. Now we're going to share with each other and however you view the spiritual awakening or 
The other material we've read, this business of resting on our laurels, some of you probably have had experience doing that, figuring you got it made, let's go out and have some fun now, let's go make money, let's get on with our life for us. The, the human solution is to say, we got to balance your life, they, they tell us. Now I hear somebody say, I've decided to balance my life, I give them about six weeks before they drink. Because balancing my life means precisely that I'm taking over again. Whatever I said in the third step prayer, I take it back. Now I'm running the show again. Now I'm going to play God again. Now I don't drink anymore. Now I can go back and I can make good on all those dreams I had. Now I don't drink anymore. I've done my job. I don't have to give. I can now begin to take. And it's, it, it is never anything but a terrible mistake. Who'd like to start the sharing? Did I see a hand? Or were you just going to brush your head? <laughs> Why don't you share with us, dear? Yeah, 
God is there, don't judge. And those are all tools to get me closer to spiritual awakening. And um, that's how I see them. Thank you. I thought you had something to say. Mm-hmm. Turns uh, out I was right. right. <laughs> yeah. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Charlotte. Hey, Charlotte. Hi, Charlotte. And, um, one thing kind of hit me. Um, you know, um, I think it was the last meeting they were talking about um, something that, that you know, alluded to this. And it just hit me a lot of times, you know, um, when I go through my down periods in life where I just, I'm one of those people that, you know, I start working the program a lot of times when a fire gets lit under my butt for whatever reason. Um, And by the grace of God, you know, I haven't found it necessary to drink, but a lot of times I rest on my laurels and I get caught up in quote unquote the other materialistic things that I, that my will thinks that I need. And usually they're 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 few and they're they're not what I need. But to make a long story short, it just kind of dawned on me that you know over the last couple of weeks I've been feeling down and just kind of empty. And I realized you know as I look back, there are plenty of other periods in my sobriety where I felt that way. And and for me, I look at that and in essence is kind of like a, a spiritual, or not a spiritual, but an awakening for me because every single time I feel bad, like was mentioned in the other meeting, or this meeting, um, it usually has something to do with something spiritually being wrong with me. You know, it, it doesn't mean that I have to go necessarily, you know, to depression and ominous or, or whatever, or jump into some other bandwagon or or whatever, it just means that there's usually something lacking in me spiritually. And um, I'm not going to keep talking and talking, but that's that's really the bottom line for me, you know, that I am lacking spiritually. And if I really choose to think about it just a little bit, it's usually something real simple. And for me, it has to do with a lot of sitting on my hands and not doing a lot of the, the service for other people that... That, you know, that God, I believe God knows that I'm capable of doing something instead of going into my own world and isolating and trying to think about what next that I'm going to get in my life that I so badly need. And um, I've seen countless people who have a lot of money and toys go back and drink, so I know that's not the answer, but thanks for letting me share. No, thank you, Charlie. Sure, sure. Who's next now? Marilyn. I'm Marilyn. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Marilyn. Hi. Um, a couple lines I like in here is the possibility, I woke up to the possibility that God hadn't put me on earth for the purpose of getting all the money, prestige, and romance that I could lay my hands on. And um, something that someone very wise said to me when I first came to this, Life is not um, here to entertain you, Marilyn. And um, you, that your true happiness is going to come from another purpose, not to be entertained by these things. And um, then I like what it said about it. As soon as I learned acceptance, my pain subsided. And then, and then they got like a JFK line here. It says, "What had I done for the fellowship? That's not what AA can do for you, but what you can do for AA." <laughs> it's like um, it's not about getting the stuff, is what they're saying here. It's not about getting the stuff, or about being healthy even, because it says here, if sick, he was an inspiration to those both sick and well, thinking of others. And if poor in pocket, he could be often rich in spirit, an eager worker and servant of our society, thinking of others. So it all goes back to, I feel, I, whenever I feel bad, I'm thinking of my, my needs. I'm thinking of my needs. And then when I, real, when I say to myself, God knows all your needs. He created you with all your needs. 
So he knows what your needs are, and he actually wants the best for you, better than what you, because you're thinking of your needs, you're going to manipulate something that is shortchanged to what he really wants for you with your needs. So leave your needs alone. He's taking care of that. And you are supposed to do your work. And the work is go to work and do a good job and help others. And you're supposed to do your work. And God's taking care of your needs. Because if I, if I focus on my needs, I feel bad. <laughs> so I, I like this because as soon as I learned acceptance, my pain subsided. It's like, I, and, and for me, that's the new life that works is forgetting about what I need <clears throat> and thinking about how I can be helpful and kind to the people that God brings in front of me on that particular day. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. And who's next? Yes, ma'am.
and I still go through all my craziness and all my, you know, um, stuff that, that I guess it was so ingrained. But on the whole, every day gets better. It, it, it really is. And um, when I first learned how to pray um, in these meetings, uh, and I was told to pray, and I was all for it, anything that would help, um, I, I made up a prayer that I would say religiously every morning and every night, and I have done for the past nine years. Um, you know, it, was, it started off with a friendly prayer, prayer, and then went into my own little, um, you know, what I wanted, which is take take away the blocks to love and, and take away my fear. And and then I, would, I had a whole list of the gifts that I asked for, faith, hope, trust, and courage, all these things, you know, that I was asking for. And, then, and it was a really long prayer. And then at the end, I would say, bless my family, friends, and, and um, bless everybody. <laughs> and, uh, and in the past three, about three years ago, or two years ago, yeah, I, I took away all those gifts. I took them out of my prayer, and I, and I just had one thing that I asked for, and I have not asked for ever since then, every, every day, and that's clarity. To me, like, whatever else I want, the be the, the most important gift to me is clarity, and I've been asking for it. And of course, you know, I find that when I ask God for something and it comes from my heart and I really, really want it, I get it. And, and so the clarity has been coming. It's like it every day. I have all these, wow, wow, you know, oh yeah, seeing things differently. Awakening. I have little spiritual awakenings every single day where I'm hit with seeing things, something for the first time, not having seen it before. And so my life can never be boring or dull or, you know, it's just like exciting every day. It's an adventure because something new is opened up. But it's also hard work because I can't let up. I can't, you know? Just, um, I think I heard in the meeting, so if you're not going forward, you're going backwards. There's no such thing as you know, just standing still. And so, if, and, and being, you know, naturally lazy, I, work is, is not something I like to do, but, you know, I'm not willing to go back to where I was. And, and I don't have to, you know, I'll never forget where I was. And I'm, I'm not going back there. And if it takes the work and it takes the doing whatever I have to do every day, and it has to be on a daily basis or else it doesn't work, I do it. And I have been doing it, and I can't believe that I can possibly be disciplined enough to do it. But it, the, motiva the motivation really is I don't want to be in pain. But at the same time, as the, the experience grows and, and uh, I, I finally, you know, I'm starting to reach that place that I was shown when I was a child of, of total peace. You know, that, you know, that in the Bible says the peace that passes all understanding. I've actually experienced it, and I have, I do experience it at times, and I know that that's all that I want. There's nothing more that I want than that. And so it's not like the motivation doesn't have to be not wanting to be in pain anymore. It's just knowing that, you know, what else do I want in this life except to feel that peace? And nothing else changes. I mean, I'll go walking and my life goes on the way it goes. And and it's wonderful to turn everything over to God every day because then, I, you know, being lazy, I let him do all the work. And <laughs> so I'm, you know, it's great. You know, I just sit back and everything gets done for me. Although I do, you know, the physical action, I don't, you know, it, it's sort of a contradiction. In one way, it's hard work, and another way, I don't have to do anything. Both those things are true. Anyway. Thank you very much. Who's next? 
Let me say it on another level. Hey, there you go. choose his own conception of God and it was only necessary that he be willing to believe he said that statement hit me hard it melted the icy intellectual mountain in whose shadow I had lived and shivered many years I stood in the sunlight at last exactly the same thing happened with him good thanks for sharing that with us who's next Doc. My name is Howard. I'm a member of AA. Hey, Howard. Uh, I uh, can't tell you how great I feel being back here after being gone for two weeks. And, uh, well, we're going to send the AA police after you, know. I was going to look for the AA police. Yeah, okay. I was like going looking for the gorilla. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I was ready. I was going to call up and get his phone number. And uh, I was up in Jersey getting some medical exams, etc. And uh, I went to some meetings up by me, but I can't tell you. I didn't have any of the tapes or anything, and uh, I felt like I was a, a soldier without his army group, you know? It was, I felt, when the hell am I going to get back there to, to be part of the group again? I was feeling lost, overwhelmed, and uh, I really started to get depressed up there, and I'm glad to be back. Um, and one of the things that I noticed started to happen to me was... It's really coming slowly with me. I've been dragging my feet for a year now, and uh, it, it's like I've got that rock with a hundred pound lead weight behind me. So now I know that I'm sort of lively nuts because I've been dragging that. <laughs> but um, when I was up there, and, and I've needed some help with putting together some paperwork for some problems at work and disability and things like that, and I have just been terrible. And, and, and whatever with paperwork, it sits and it sits, and I've got files on files, and it looks like I've got, you know, the Department of Paperwork in my in my uh, uh, little office there, and nothing gets done. So, uh, actually paying my brother to help me do some of this stuff, otherwise I'll end up with absolutely nothing, and, and that's been working okay. But now he always gets down on me. How are you? Yeah, I didn't do this and didn't do this. Yeah, you lied to me about this. And I didn't lie to him. I've done it. I just forgot where I put it. And so now I know it's somewhere, but I can't find it. Because, well, you're lying to me and Shannon and his wife are saying, wait a minute. Don't call me a liar again because he did a couple times and it wasn't true. Now, remember what you said in the book. I said, okay, yeah, I, I'm not so good with the paperwork. I understand that. And, and I am going round and round in circles and I understand that. But I'm telling you, look, you, you're putting me here at the fork of a road. Either one of two things is going to happen. I love you dearly and I want to communicate with you because at the end of what used to be our family way of doing business on my mom's side was they would talk to each other for five years. Why? I have no freaking idea. 
but they just wouldn't talk over stupid stuff, and then they died, and then they wouldn't go to each other's funeral. I mean, it was craziness in that side of the family. I said, I really want to talk to you, and the day that we don't talk to me is stupid over stupid stuff. But, number one, you can't keep calling me liars and then making it up to me and then spouting off. You can only clean your side of the street, and I clean my side of the street. No editorializing. I don't do it to you. you don't Where in the world did you hear that? From you. Oh, oh, it's in the book, isn't it? <laughs> and so what I started to do was bring up that sort of thing is, you do your half, I do my half, but I don't criticize you and you don't criticize me. That's the way it has to be. Otherwise, the only alternative for that is, we don't talk. And I can tell you what, that pains me terribly to be able to have to say that, and it's not a threat. Well, you're hurting me by doing that, and I can't allow you to do that. Right. And I have to let that sink in. And I have to continue to do that a couple of times so he sees I'm serious about that. Because he's been doing it so long. That's a natural reaction for him. Yeah. And it's, it seems, a couple more times, it seems to be working. Yep. And, and, and so if we do that, I'm going to say, well, look, I still want to talk to you, but I just can't allow that sort of behavior. Exactly. Stop right there. Right, exactly. So it's not a pissing contest between him and I. Right. <laughs> But it's just, that's the, the line in the sand. And so that's by being slick, you can actually get and change other's behaviors without yelling. That to me is amazing. But it has to, you really have to be, stop right there. No more of that. Yep. You know what I mean? But that's a big change in me too, because I was typically on the phone yelling at him, and, and that sort of loss of control between both of us was the way we would handle things, and that wouldn't work. So by being quiet on my part, that all of a sudden changed his listening behavior because he's saying, why aren't you ranting and raving on the phone with me? And that all of a sudden caught his attention said, you know, something's going on with you because you're not behaving the same old way. And, and that's, if you will, step by step, that small thing. Have you learned to say, hmm? I'm learning. <laughs> or so, gee, that's interesting. You know, okay. okay. <laughs> you know, it said we don't we don't go for perfection, but we go for. Yeah, well, you you just we got to burn it in your forehead, doc, and yeah. when it, the occasion occurs, instead of engaging in any kind of ver verbal fisticuff, you just say hmm. hmm. Can you say say hmm, doc? Hmm. hmm. Yeah. <laughs> any doctor has to be good at that. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, but this is taking out of the realm of being a doctor, okay. emotional brother. It's different. You know. <laughs> 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 you got to you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, guys. we got to close this shindig down here. Uh, let's put some bucks in the in the hat. you got to pay the rent. Remember that Marilyn is watching. <laughs> Somebody bring the wheelchair to get me out to the car.
We gave our bodies on the sponsorship of Sadie Gate last week. I was in Ohio. Oh, you're going to get this one. Yeah, I did get it last week. I did. I got the, I got the, I got the, I got the big book. The who? I got the big book workshop. I did last, last Saturday night. Saturday, but I didn't get the sponsorship. I didn't get the. And how about the week before last Saturday? Yeah. What was that one about? That would have been the first of the uh, big books. It sounded, like, it sounded like today was the first. Day. He went over all of it at the beginning. You know, like today was the first one. So what about two weeks ago on sponsorship day? He just went over the whole thing. Yeah, he probably just. Yeah, that's what he did. He yeah. went over the three phases. Two weeks ago, sponsorship workshop. I'll give him to you. Okay, so I get that one and today's. Will you come to the book tomorrow? Yeah. I'll try to get one. Okay.